Welcome to this Beyond Zero e-learning module on the management of TB HIV co-infection. In this particular section, we're going to be looking at managing gene expert negative TB. To help us discuss the management of gene expert negative TB, we're going to work through a typical case you might see in an outpatient department or in a clinic. So Dinio is a 26-year-old female who works as a waitress. She was diagnosed HIV positive six months ago and has a CD4 count of 360. Not yet on art, and she comes to see you today complaining of a persistent cough for about a month now. So we're going to do our normal approach, which I'm not going to spend much time on. We're going to obviously screen for our TB, our main four symptoms of TB, and record those. We're going to look for any other symptoms of TB. So is she also short of breath? We're going to ask a lot more about the cough, about the sweats, and about the fever. And we also want to see if there might be other systems that might be causing her symptoms. So for example, um, does she have difficulty breathing when she's lying flat? Um, does she get swollen ankles? and other cardiac symptoms. And of course, we want a good medical history. What is her TB contact history? Has she had TB in the past? Um, what is the history of her um, IPT or any other prophylaxis that she might have had? So Dino says to you that her cough is productive. It's about a whitish sputum, um, and she's been losing weight, about five kilograms over the last month. She doesn't have fever. But she sometimes sweats so much at night that she actually has to get up and change her clothes. So great. So what's the next step? So we've got a fairly straightforward guideline on that, that we need to collect a sputum specimen for gene expert um, on the spot. And we need to make sure that Dinia returns for the result and that she's well counseled that this is not the end of the, of the consultation. So just to remind us in terms of screening for TV, the gene expert algorithm has been around for about two or three years now, so most people are, are quite comfortable in using it. Um, but all TB sub-suspects, we now collect a sputum um, for a gene expert. And that includes DRTB contacts, non-contact symptomatic individuals, retreatment after relapse. Um, and important to note, we're only collecting one sputum, and the follow-up sputum will depend on that sputum result. So Dinia returns to a clinic for her results, um, but she still has a cough and she's not feeling any better. And the sputum gene expert result is negative. This is a common scenario in our HIV positive patients, where you'll see a patient and you think to yourself, oh, I'm quite sure this is TB. Um, and when the results come, they do not confirm your suspicions. So do we still suspect TB or can we send Dinia home now? No, of course, she could still have TB. Um, and there's a very specific approach and guideline for looking for TB in patients who are gene expert, um, but a negative, but HIV positive. So gene expert is a, an amazingly um, sensitive test to find TB in HIV negative patients. You can see it's about 88%. Um, and in HIV positive patients, it's lower at about 79%. It still means we're going to find most of our pulmonary TB. Um, and it's much better than the AFBs or the smear, smear microscopies we used to do, where you would need about 10,000 bacilli to be able to make a diagnosis. Culture is still our gold standard with 10 bacilli, and because we are going to be growing the organism, we can still find pulmonary TB. Um, but GeneXpert only needs 130 bacilli to yield a positive result and is therefore able to find most of our patients, but not everyone. So HIV positive patients um, produce much less inflammation, they don't have much of an immune system, and they're therefore less likely to cough up large numbers of TB bacilli, and therefore we see them more often having smear negative TB. Although we don't um, use the old AFB smears anymore for diagnosis, it's still important for the follow-up of TB treatment, and therefore we still routinely take an AFB on patients who have been diagnosed with TB. So let us look at the algorithm for gene expert negative HIV positive TB suspects. So um, these are just for our gene expert negative patients. And you can see as soon as somebody's gene expert negative, we actually need to know their HIV status to be able to um, know how to assess our patients best. If the patient is HIV negative, 
we're actually not too worried and we're going to treat with antibiotics and we're going to um, be looking for other causes for their cough, or for other causes on why they are not improving. Um, but if the patient is HIV positive, we are still very, very suspicious um, for TB in those patients. And they are a very set um, approach to these patients. So firstly, importantly, we're going to look clinically very closely and see if we can find um, other symptoms that might be indicating something different or might be confirming the TB. Um, and in these scenarios, a chest X-ray is very much indicated. We would have a not such a, a quick response for X-ray for our HIV negative patients, but in HIV positive patients, at this point, you would want to get an X-ray. We will also, at this point, collect another specimen to start looking for TB. Um, and the recommendation is to send a culture, which will then be done in either an LPA or a DST. And the challenge with this is, of course, your culture result is only going to come back after four to six weeks. Um, once we've got our x-ray results, if our x-ray results are suspicious of TB, even if the patient is gene expert negative, we will be starting that patient on TB treatment. But the challenge comes if the x-ray findings are normal. Um, and the idea is that we treat with antibiotics and monitor the response after treatment for one week. You can see in the algorithm, we would then say that we will review our LPA and DST results um, but remember, there's going to be a time lapse here because within a week, your patient would have finished their course for antibiotics, but it might be several weeks before you're actually going to get your DST results back. So to summarize, when you see that patient with gene expert negative TB on the day, there's basically three things you need to do. You need to start them on some antibiotics just to make sure it's not a bacterial infection. You're going to send for a chest X-ray. And we're going to send another sputum specimen for TB culture. And the way you request it is for a culture with an LPA or DST. Um, but we are still allowing for empiric TB treatment at this point. It's also just important to note that because we use Gene Expert now as our main way of diagnosis, it's not going to be picking up your non tuberculosis mycobacteria. And therefore, the culture um, will be helpful to help us pick up, for example, um, MAC uh, that we might miss on your gene expert diagnosis. So this is one scenario where we're actually taking a TB culture. Um, in the old days, we used to do TB cultures on all our HIV positive patients, but we no longer do that. And there's specific scenarios in which getting a TB culture is still important. The most important and most common scenario where you would do a TB culture is if you have somebody who comes back with a gene expert rifampicin resistant mycobacterium um, tuberculosis on gene expert. And those patients, a TB culture must be sent. And also specifying that it was rifampicin resistant so that they can look not only for INH resistance, but all of the other second line TB drugs. But we will also do um, a gene expert in patients where we have a high risk MDR TB suspect for example, in our prison scenarios, but also if you have a healthcare worker who works in an MDR TB unit, if they start um, having symptoms, you would send for a TB culture. And then the third one now is the scenario of the gene expert negative patient and an HIV positive TB suspect where you are still worried about TB. So back to our patient. So we're going to give Denia some amoxicillin today. We're going to order a chest X-ray. Um, and we've taken that second sputum sample, which we've sent off for smear and culture. But when Dunia returns you to see you after the five days of the antibiotics, she says that she's feeling no better. She feels that she's still losing weight. The x-ray is very nonspecific. It's one of those x-rays where um, nothing dramatically jumps out at you. Um, and what do you do now? So as I've mentioned, our actual algorithm doesn't really tell us what happens in these two, three weeks where we're now waiting for our culture results. And quite often, patients can be quite sick, and it might not be appropriate to wait four to six weeks when you are highly suspicious. Um, because, of course, our big suspicion at this point is extrapulmonary TB. Even the culture that's going to come back in four to six weeks is only going to tell us about pulmonary TB. Um, and the patient in front of you might have TB in another site, and then sputum is not going to be helpful. So we need to be quite systematic in how we look for extrapulmonary TB in a patient with TB symptoms um, where we can't find it in the lungs. 
So firstly, we've already done our x-ray. So that's the first place to go and looking. And of course, now we're looking for lymphadenopathy, um, pleural and very important pericardial infusions, TB, pericardi TB pericarditis being quite common and within the Eastern Cape in comparison to the rest of the country. Now, we cannot use any of these different investigations to give us a definitive result, but they all add to our picture. And normocytic anemia can make us very suspicious. If a patient is a normal hemoglobin, um, you might be less suspicious of extrapulmonary TB and give the patient a bit more time to recover from probably an acute infection. But if there's already an anemia there, it shows that the patient has probably been iller um, for a period of time. CRPs are very controversial, and the evidence actually uh, tells us that it's not a great test to help us for TB. Um, nevertheless, it's something that you would add to your, to your suspicions. If the CRP is very high, it gives us a high suspicion of TB. But a normal CRP in a patient with HIV does not exclude TB. It just makes it a little bit less likely. Um, generally, CRP is found to be a little bit better than using ESR, but again, treat with treat with suspicion the results. So again, just to add to our, our pot would be to do a, a liver function test. Um, and a liver function test, again, just gives you indications. And we are looking here for more of an obstructive picture. So often you would see a mixed picture with your LFTs with everything being a little bit up. And what we want to see is that the ALP is, is significantly increased in comparison with the ALT. Um, and this could be due to TB lymph adenopathy in the abdomen or even granulomatous infiltration of the TB into the liver. Again, it's only a, a suspicion. If you were to see anything on LFT, our gold standard at the moment would be to get an ultrasound, um, looking either for lymph adenopathy or splenic abscesses. Um, the challenge is that in rural areas, we don't always have access to ultrasound. And often all you have is a suspicious looking LFT, an anemic patient, perhaps an increased CRP. If there is a gland, by all means put a needle in it. Um, and one can do a gene expert now on, on FNA, um, especially if, well, in scenarios where you're actually getting enough fluid back to, to send that off. There is also now the possibility to get very small back tick bottles from the um, NHLS, which you can rinse your needle in, and you can send that for TB culture. If you have patients with extrapulmonary TB, um, especially those patients who might have ascites, a lot of loss of weight, looking really, really sick, um, do consider doing an LP, even if there isn't um, any neurological symptoms. If the patient also has confusion, an LP is mandatory. And note that 15% of patients could have even a normal LP early in the disease process, again, because your HIV patient is not making enough um, inflammation. If you do send off a lumbar puncture, do do a gene expert on that as well, and obviously send for TB culture. A useful additional investigation to try and get a, um, a sample if your sputum cultures might eventually come back negative to send an early morning urine sample. And these can be useful in disseminated TB um, and with a, a quite a good yield in patients who have TB spread throughout the body. So this is a little summary in how you would decide to start empiric treatment for extrapulmonary TB. If you have a patient where there is lymphadenopathy, be it high lower metastinal or intra-abdominal, um, and if the patient's got TB symptoms, you would be using several key elements to, to make you suspicious of extrapulmonary TB. That will include your increased ARP and GDT, patient's anemic, CRP might be increased. And if possible, you'll actually confirm this all with ultrasound. But in rural hospitals, this is not always possible. Um, and you will have a patient where you will have a very high suspicion um, of extrapulmonary TB, and it's appropriate to start TB treatment. In a patient with a pericardial infusion, especially if they've got TB constitutional symptoms, we would assume TB even while you're waiting for your pleural tap results. Um, and any patient where you do a pleural acidic tap and you've got a lymphocytic exudate, so you can already see that there's a, um, a lot of protein in that sample that you've just 
just drawn, you would start them on TB treatment even while you're waiting for your results. And a gene expert negative result on a pleural or a cytic um, tap does not mean that the patient does not have extrapulmonary TB. Um, as a matter of fact, in most of our patients with HIV with a pleural effusion, we would assume TB um, and start the patient on TB treatment. Very important, if you decide to start empiric treatment, do at least two clinically relevant specimens um, and send it off for mycobacterial culture to help you later on in case the patient doesn't respond to treatment, especially in looking for MDR-TB. So this could include sending, of course, your pleural and effusion tap for a TB culture, but also um, urine cultures can be very useful in disseminated TB. So Indenio is quite unwell, um, and we decide to start on empiric TB treatment um, immediately. So what regimen would we now use, and what does this depend on? And fortunately, this has become a very simple question, because all of our patients, um, if we, if they're obviously if they're gene expert positive or FAMPASIN sensitive, but in our patients who we suspect of extrapulmonary TB or we're gene expert negative TB, we're going to use our standard regimen one. Um, several years ago, we used to add in streptomycin, depending on if the patient has had previous treatment or failing treatment, but we no longer do that. We're going to try and first find confirmation of resistance before we add in any other drugs. Um, and that includes our normal rifampicin, isoniazide, pyrazinamide, and ethambutol. We're giving it seven days a week, um, and this is a very effective regimen for treating our TB. But, of course, it's not all just about getting Dinia on TB treatment. She has TB HIV co-infection, and there's a few other things we also need to keep in mind. We're going to need to put on ARVs, and the next little module will cover that. Very important to remember to put all our patients with TB um, on cotramoxazole. They're all stage 3. And this is important because TB patients are more likely to develop PCP, regardless of the, the CD4 count or PJP. Important to ask about TB contacts at home, especially our patients who are admitted to hospital or are being looked after by the doctor. We quite often assume the nurses will do their TB contact screening. If you have a patient who is admitted to your hospital for a month or six weeks to be stabilized on TB treatment, it's the duty of you as a doctor to make sure to find out, are there any children at home who's under five years old? Are there any um, individuals at home that might have HIV for they will all need prophylaxis? And, of course, we will have a lot of discussion around the adherence to TB medication and the fact that they will start feeling better soon and the importance of completing the six-month course. So, in summary, um, our gene expert negative TB patients in HIV-positive patients um, needs active management until TB is excluded, and we cannot use that result as the end of the, the diagnostic journey. Um, in our next short e-learning module, we will be looking at TB HIV co-infection, and we will continue this case with DINEO and how we're going to monitor this patient once they are now on TB treatment and also on ARVs. Thank you very much.